I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle, which is coming right up. But first, a few words by way of introduction. We all know the phrase disruptive technology, things that, after they've been invented, leave everything else behind, the way the computer left the typewriter behind, how optic fiber left copper wire behind. And it doesn't seem to be stopping. The speed of this change is so vast that I'm inclined to think often that technological innovation is more important than politics. And although we talk about politics on this program and it's a political discussion program frequently, increasingly I'm inclined to talk more about the larger changes, the underlying changes which technology brings about, which is revolutionizing the way we work, the way we play, and quite possibly our whole future as a society, the shape of human organization on Earth. That sounds pretty big, pretty bumpers, but it really is changing things. Look how we take it for granted, flying around the world, getting into an airplane. When I was a boy, that was a big undertaking, if at all. It wasn't until I took my father flying in a light airplane that he had ever been in an airplane. And I'm not sure that a brother of mine who lives in Africa has yet been in an airplane. And yet we in America and in Europe and in most parts of the world, at least in the advanced countries, take it for granted. The world changed with the 707. It changed with the jet engine. And it is changing now because of materials. As a result, we're going to talk today about one of the most extraordinary materials yet developed. It's called graphene. You probably haven't heard of it. It's a layer of carbon atoms in a lattice, a bonded carbon atoms. I will be corrected by my guest, I'm sure. And it is strong. It does strange things, powerful things, conducts electricity, and it's two-dimensional. You can't, uh, it's just not wide enough to be three-dimensional, and uh, you can't see it. I'm going to be talking today about graphene, this extraordinary stuff, with my co-host, Linda Gasparello, of course, and with Dr. Neaton Paduri, who is the director of the Institute of Molecular and Nanoscale Innovation at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Welcome to the broadcast, and we will be back to question you about the magical graphene. White House Chronicle is produced in collaboration with WHUT, Howard University Television. And now, the program host, nationally syndicated columnist Llewellyn King, and co-host Linda Gasparello. Uh, just a quick word to remind you that when I'm in Washington, I stay at the American Guest House. It's a favorite place, more like a club than a bed and breakfast, though nominally a bed and breakfast. If you're moving to Washington for a meeting or something, check it out, American Guest, Guest House. It's on the web, and you'll be well and warmly received into a very comfortable environment for your stay in the nation's capital. Doctor, it's lovely to see you. Tell us, in your words, what graphene is. I probably bungled that introduction. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Llewellyn and Linda, for having me on the show. It's really a great pleasure to be here. So graphene, to put this in uh, a layperson's perspective, it is basically carbon atoms. The atoms, as you know, are very, very, very small. You, can, you, cannot, you really cannot see it. And these carbon atoms are bonded in a hexagonal lattice that extends into the infinity. Yeah, we have it on the so screen now. There's a picture of it. Right. Isn't right. that, that's, that's it? That's, that's and that's how do we get a graphene. picture like that? Is that a drawing or is that actually <laughs> this a is photograph if it's too small to be seen? Yeah, this is actually a schematic diagram. Ah. But, uh, but with powerful electron microscopes, actually, you can see the individual atoms in graphene now. So this graphene is um, basically looks like a chicken wire structure and it extends into uh, long distances. And as you pointed out, it is really a two-dimensional crystal, which basically means it is a surface. It is all surfaces. So when you look at a material or, a, or, a, or a, like a cup or something like that, it has a surface and has an interior. But when you have a single layer, atomic layer uh, material, it basically is all surface. So that is the, basically a definition of graphene in the nutshell. 
Now, there are also analogs of graphene in other materials. So, for example, a uh, compound of boron and nitrogen also forms a similar structure and it can also form an atomic uh, uh, thin, thin layer. And there are other examples of molybdenum, molybdenum disilicide and there's newly uh, coined brophene made of boron. And also, there's been recent discovery of phosphorus, which can also form a single layer. Uh, atomic lattice. Let's go back to graphene because yes. that's the most advanced. That's correct. Part. I understand that there are thousands of patents being filed. Mm -hmm. uh, how can people file patents so early <laughs> when they haven't done anything? This seems to me very strange. Are these indefensible right. patents? They, these are these are you know the Chinese. I think have more than a thousand. The South North Korea, uh, the South, South Koreans. Koreans. Right. Uh, no, the North Korea is not there. Right. Uh, the South Koreans have uh, a thousand patents. The, it was the Brits who had read, who found it, wasn't it, at Manchester University? That's correct. Right. So uh, there's been a there's been a lot of work already been done on on graphene, and I think people. What are its uses? Okay. So first of all, uh, people have thought of graphene for a long time because it basically is the is the ingredient of what graphite is made of, and graphite is nothing but you know, pencil lead. The, right. the, the stuff that you write with. So graphite is essentially layers of graphene that are bonded together. So you can think about it as if it's a deck of cards that are, that are bonded by electrostatic attraction or by static electricity. So you can imagine the card is very strong in the card dimension, but static electricity bonding the cards together is quite weak, maybe more than 1,000 times weaker. So. The uses of graphene, uh, so basically what this group in Manchester did is actually isolated that uh, graphene. And this is, where, this is where graphene was first, was created in Manchester. That's right. Apparently it was created early on, but they didn't know that they created graphene. But the group in Manchester knew what they were doing, and they separated the individual sheets. They, and this they, is they, Manchester, they, England. This is Manchester, England, <laughs> not, not New Hampshire. Not New Hampshire. Right. So they separated the graphene, and they knew that this was graphene individual sheets. And what they found is extraordinary properties, which is what is leading to uh, potential applications of, of graphene. So first of all, graphene has a very high electrical conductivity very in a single good. layer sheet. It's called ballistic conduction, not, nothing, uh, uh, it's a technical term used. It is also extremely strong in the, in the, in the dimension, in, in the plane of the, of, of the graphene. And it is stronger than diamond or stiffer than diamond. So those are extraordinary properties. It has extremely high thermal conductivity, also uh, higher than diamond. So these are these extreme That's properties. Heat, heat transfer. Heat that, transfer, yes, yeah, heat transfer. So the thermal conductivity is essentially how, uh, how well the heat can be transferred. So these are extraordinary properties or extreme properties that this graphene has. And that is why there is this excitement in, uh, in, the, in the engineering and the science world to try and exploit those properties into new applications. Right. And the, in the manufacturing world, where right. would its applications be when you, when you get to a point that, that it can be manufactured right. at, at a great scale? Right. So let me talk about the, the processing or fabrication yeah. first, and then we'll talk about the, the application, how they relate to the property that I just discussed. So you can, first of all, you need to make a distinction between graphene as a long sheet. So we're talking about sheets that are centimeter inches, square inches, up to square feet. So it's a single layer that basically extends in, in a square feet, which is like a size of your tile, a uh, kitchen tile. So that is quite large area. So that's the single sheet. Then we can also talk about graphene that are essentially flakes, which means they're uh, the hair, thickness of your hair size. And they're still single layer, but they're extremely small dimension in the planar dimension. And of course, the thickness is the atomic thickness. Right. So these are the two different things we need to talk about. So one is a sheet, the other one is the a flakes. flake. Right. So the sheets can be uh, fabricated by using uh, one method is called mechanical exfoliation. And this is really the famous Scotch tape method which <laughs> the Manchester <laughs> group used to actually isolate the graphene. That's a wonderful <laughs> story. They yes. actually use scotch tape and pencil there. And, and, uh, and yeah. sort of uh, pencil uh, shavings, right? Similar to that, yes. Right. So basically exfoliate, um, use scotch tape several times until they got to a single layer of, of graphene. And this is how all they made the physics discoveries and ended up uh, winning the physics Nobel Prize in 2010. 
Unfortunately, this is not a very scalable method. You can make small, small sheets, but they are not, uh, you cannot really make millions of them in a, more, in a very reproducible way. And therefore, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very good for, for doing very careful experiments and measuring properties, but you cannot really manufacture devices out of that. So the next um, innovation was using uh, what is called chemical vapor deposition as a method to make single layer large sheets. And the way that happens is you take a sheet of copper, the copper foil, just like the aluminum foil you would have in your kitchen, mm -hmm. and then you cook it essentially in a furnace at high temperature, 1000 degrees Celsius, in a mixture of methane and hydrogen. And what happens is that the copper uh, sheet catalyzes a reaction and deposits carbon only a single layer thick onto the, onto the copper and you form a graphene sheet. And then you dissolve the copper, after you're done with the experiment, you dissolve the copper and then you have you're a graphene, left with your graphene, graphene sheet. sheet. Right. So that's a much uh, better way of doing things. Unfortunately, the quality of the graphene is not as good as the mechanical exfoliated graphene. What so is the tolerance for heat of the graphene itself? So graphene can withstand extremely high temperatures as long as it's an inert atmosphere or it's in vacuum. As soon as you heat it in air, it'll burn, it's just like coal or, or, or ca carbon would burn. Right. So there's some of the outlandish ideas that I've heard that yeah. graphene will be used in power plants, and this is not likely. I, I don't think so. Its earlier right. uses will be where, Doctor? Okay, so... Uh, uh, maybe we can go back to the processing. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, right. yes, so absolutely. Is, so this is the, these are the two main methods for making sheets of graphene. Then you can also make these flakes of graphene using what is called chemical exfoliation. So you can take graphite, which can be mined from the ground, mm -hmm. which is essentially a pencil lead, and then you treat them with uh, rather nasty chemicals and ultrasonically agitate it to actually separate the, the, the deck of cars that I was talking about. And these are very small uh, particles that you get of, of graphene. But the quality of that is actually much lower than the continuous sheets. So now you can think about applications. So let's talk about the applications for the flakes, so the small particles of graphene. So right. since they're highly conductive, much more conductive than any other uh, carbon material, you can think of using paints, conductive paints, or you can think of conductive inks using this graphene sheets or you can use them in things like battery electrodes. The lithium ion batteries use some kind of a carbon, graphite in them. So energy storage. Energy storage, right. you can use that for. You can also use it as a catalyst support in things like fuel cells. You can also make films that are barriers because, because if you look at this chicken wire structure, the, the, the hexagon is actually very small. You cannot penetrate any gas or any water through them. So you can form barrier layers, like a corrosion-resistant layer. Maybe we could put like that, that up on the screen again, now that we heard what it is. Right. There so we are. There's so, the so that small size of the hexagon is extremely small and it's imp essentially impervious to most gases and materials. Most atoms cannot pass cannot through. Cannot pass through. So you can actually it's extremely strong. create, uh, create right. a barrier. Right. And dense. Then you can also use, use it for things like um, uh, supercapacitors. These are all in energy storage uh, 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 devices. Right. Then if you talk about the large sheets, one of the main applications that is emerging is that is of what is called conducting electrodes. So you want a transparent electrode, you want a transparent material, yet you want it to be electrically conducting. Right. And that is the, the area. So things like touch screen. So touch screen, you, can, you want to see through the screen, yet it has electrical conductivity that acts as a switch. Oh, and oh you actually press I'm on seeing it. excitement in manufacturing right. already. <laughs> right. So places like Samsung, for example, yeah. have made uh, several feet by several feet graphene sheet based conducting electrodes where you can see through it at the same time it is electrically conducting. And this is because of these unusual properties of, of graphene in terms of absorption of light and electrical conductivity. Let's take a little so station break here. Right. Uh, you are watching or listening to White House Chronicle, and I am Llewellyn King, the host. I'm joined by Linda Gasparello, the co-host, and today a very special guest who is Dr. Nitin Padtour, uh, and he is an expert on graphene, this extraordinary substance we're discussing. Uh, the purpose of this is 
not yet known totally, but some uses are appearing. This program can be heard on radio. It can be heard on Sirius XM radio channel 124, the POTUS channel, and it can be seen on 200 television stations <coughs> in the United States and around the world on the English language channels of the Voice of America. The official title of uh, my guest is um, Director, Institute for Molecular and Nanoscale Innovation at Brown University. As you were saying, Doctor. Yes. <coughs> so there's another application that I didn't speak of was, uh, so, sorry, so let me go back to the other applications of the, sh uh, the sheets of graphene. So the conducting electrodes would be one, one such application. Then there's a lot of talk about graphene being used in computers, in the, in the computer chip. And it turns out that graphene, although it has these uh, extreme properties in terms of electrical conduction, it cannot be re used to replace silicon. Ah, uh, that was going to be my question. Right. It doesn't switch, right? Because it, has, it doesn't have what's called a band gap, which is what you need in a semiconductor, which silicon has and does it very well. Could you just explain right. what a band gap is? So a band gap is essentially electronic levels within a material the way the electrons can, whether they can occupy a, a certain energy level or not. And if there's a band gap, then electrons cannot move across the band gap if they don't have enough energy. It's like jumping across a chasm. So if the electron has enough energy and can know, it doesn't know that it's going to jump across the chasm, it will jump. But it will not jump if it knows that it's going to fall in between. And therefore, the electrons will not pr proceed forward, and therefore, there will be no electrical conduction. So graphene, actually, the band gap is zero. And th there are ways of actually introducing a band gap, but that is, those are somewhat uh, exotic techniques people use, which basically means that uh, what is called the on-off ratio, which is what uh, a logic chip uses in, in semiconductors, uh, such as silicon, the computer chip that you have in your computer, that on-off ratio has to be extremely large, almost uh, a million. Whereas graphene on-off ratio is something like 100 to 1,000, so it's not enough. But for what are called high-frequency devices, such as amplifiers or modulators, so mm -hmm. these operate at extremely high frequencies, much higher than what silicon can operate at. So there's a place for graphene there. That's right. So there you don't need as a high uh, on-off ratio, and therefore graphene is being considered in uses where high frequencies are important, but the on-off ratio is not. So they will not perhaps make it into logic devices, but things like amplifiers and modulators. I think this is where uh, there's a lot of potential for graphene. Where will we see it? Will we see it in cell phones, uh, computers, uh, television sets? I think television sets, you will, you will see them. You'll see them on, the s on screens, touch screens. Those are some of the potential applications. Then also used in solar cells. Solar cells also need this transparent and electrical conducting property. Because you know, metals are conductors, but they're opaque, you cannot see through a metal. And that's because of the, the property that makes them conductors also absorbs light. Right. Whereas graphene is a different material altogether, and its mechanism of absorption of light and conduction is quite different, which is why it makes it such an unusual, that's why it has such unusual properties. Then you may see it in, in uh, conducting paints. You may also see it in composites. I didn't talk about that is that uh, there is a need for damage-tolerant composites, composites that are very strong and very tough, that they don't damage very easily. And these are typically made of polymers, and you need a reinforcement in the polymer. Let's, uh, for the benefit of our viewers and right. listeners, just to explain what a polymer is again. Right. A polymer is essentially plastic. So okay. it, that's it, right. It's yeah. a, a right. string of atoms. Right. So, so when you talk about carbon fiber composites, so that, that uses a carbon fiber, which is very strong, but graphene is 100 times stronger uh, than a regular fiber. And therefore, there's a lot of potential for using graphene in the as a reinforcement in composite, in a, in a carbon composite. So are we going stronger. to see it in, in, in uh, uh, baseball bats and tennis rackets, where we already well, have Well, we already carbon. have graphite in tennis rackets. Yeah, we know that. That's right. why I'm asking right. the question, right. Linda. I think so. I think there is a, yeah. a good chance. Unfortunately, the, the cost of making graphene is still high. And that is because of the, the process that you have to use to exfoliate the graphene sheets 
from from graphite and the 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 the, the chemicals that are used are not very environmentally friendly uh, and therefore yes. the therefore the cost is too high and that is perhaps why we won't see it as soon as we would like to so as soon as the cost comes down, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of innovation going on. Well, who's, <laughs> who's doing some of the, you mentioned Samsung before. Yes. Um, how about companies like IBM? Are they, are they working with uh, various uh, graph meeting? Yes. There's a lot of scientists in IBM in the research lab that are working on this high-frequency devices. Ah. Then BSF in, uh, in um, Germany, they are one of the leaders in making this uh, graphene flakes, the graphene particles. Excuse me. They'll be used in conducting paste or, or composites. So those are the uh, big companies that are. Are we likely on. to see a, com a commercial product of any sort very soon? I think this conductive paints and and composites is probably the the ones that we'll see soon, and also this conducting uh, the touch screens that that they use for for television or computers. Is there an epicenter of the research? Is there one place that is where you go to to learn about graphene? Is it your lab? <laughs> is it uh, um, IBM or, or uh, the Germans or well, Samsung, the this South Koreans? But this is so well, Samsung is leading the way in the, the con conducting electrodes. There's a lot of research going on in UK, which is where the, the graphene originated. And Europe just uh, funded a large program in graphene, almost a billion dollars over the next 10 years or so. That was the European Union? That's the European Union. And there was a big, uh, it's of course a big collaborative program with many countries involved and many u investigators involved. Isn't there yeah. a dedicated graphene institute in Singapore? I think I read something like that. That's right, yes. There is a recently funded uh, graphene institute in Singapore uh, that is doing groundbreaking research. There. So the expectations here are very high. This is not, you know, something that may be perchance you know, sometimes we see things in labs mm -hmm. that look as though they have great application. Yeah. I actually saw one involving graphite once, right. Right? a graphite foam which was going to be put into radiators, but right. it never happened. Right. But uh, uh, this is something's going to happen here, or is happening. There's something is going to happen. Something is happening, but I think something is going to happen as well. Uh, but as as you know, scientists always get very excited about uh, <laughs> discoveries, and uh, some you know they're very enthusiastic and uh, sort of somewhat exuberant when new discoveries ha new discoveries take place. But I think the the cost factor, the environmental concerns, these are all factors need to be considered before it'll really take off. But it has the potential, certainly, because of the uniqueness of the the combination of properties that graphene has. I think also that as long as the experiments are being done, you never know what's going to come out of the experimentation. You could find offshoots of the experimentation that would yield other innovations much sooner than the actual substance that they're looking at. So that's, that's a very fascinating part of science, too. That's right, yes. Yeah. Some, some new tools are developed for, uh, say, understanding or developing graphene, which can have other applications as well. Right. What about the U.S. government? Does it have a role? We often expect these very dramatic innovations to come, like the Internet, to come out of the government. Right. And this has not. Uh, has the government taken an interest? You mentioned that the European right. Union put in nearly a billion dollars. Right. Has the U.S. government been as excited or interested? Yes, I, 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 oh, yes, of course. Uh, I had f research funded by the U.S. government, the National Science Foundation, so they have taken a lot of interest, and there's a lot of projects funded in graphene. Uh, I should also mention that uh, chemical vapor deposition on copper, the, the, that was sort of a groundbreaking discovery, was uh, that happened in the U.S. in, in the University of Texas at, in Austin. What are nanotubes as opposed to graphene? They're made of graphene, right. aren't they? Right. Or so basic very similar. Correct. So you can think of the graphene, which is your chicken wire sheet, and you can roll it up, and you can weld it together, and you have yourself a carbon nanotube. And that would be what's called a single wall carbon nanotube. Now you could have multiple tubes nested inside each other, like the Russian dolls, and that would be multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And what, what do you do with nanotubes? So nanotubes have also very interesting properties. They have very interesting electrical properties. They can be made metallic conductors or they can be semiconducting, depending on how they're put together. They also have extremely high 
stiffness or mm -hmm. uh, how, how stiff the material is and extremely high strength, very similar to graphene. And we consider them to be one dimensional. So graphene is two dimensional, this is one dimensional. So when you have one dimensional material, it also opens up different possibilities of how you can disperse it inside another material, for example, in a composite. And that can result in very interesting properties such as high strength and stiffness in, in composites. You can also use them for, for making um, devices. The difference between graphene and carbon nanotubes is you can actually have a band gap in carbon nanotubes depending on how, what the, what's called the chirality, how it's bonded. And therefore, there are devices, transistor devices. Right, which graphene does not have. Right. It doesn't have that band gap. Right. But the problem is that carbon nanotubes are difficult to manipulate because they're single, so they're like spaghetti strands. You have cooked spaghetti in a bowl, <laughs> and how do you make a well-defined device? You have to actually pick out the spaghetti, cut it into shape, size, and put it where you want it, and do this billion times over in order to make a device. I'd like to ask you, <laughs> Professor, yes. uh, before we finish, to tell us what you do when you're not worrying about graphene and nanotubes <laughs> and tiny, tiny, tiny things. Particles. And in, in your regular life, are you a sportsman? Uh, I'm uh, actually an avid uh, motorcyclist. My goodness. <laughs> right, so you probably didn't uh, realize that from an Ivy League professor, but uh, I do. No, motorcyclists come in all shapes. They're like so private pilots. They right. come in all shapes <laughs> right. and sizes. And professions, right. right. Yeah. So that's my hobby. So I like to go long distance motorcycle riding. So I have a Aprilia Futura uh, sport touring motorcycle, which I like to ride. What is the power of that? It's a thousand cc. So engine. that's a that's a pretty substantial motorcycle. That's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, motorcycles, for those who don't know, go in power from 125 cc to a thousand. Yes, you could right. do a lot of. I'm sure very comfortable and higher on that bike. That's right. I remember. Uh, give my age away when a large motorcycle was 500 cc. That's right. Yes. Uh, when the Brits dominated the motorcycle market. That's right. Long gone. There were two American manufacturers, the, the fabulous Harley Davidson and one called Indian, Indian right. which uh, <laughs> faded away, but mm -hmm. Harley is still with us. Mm -hmm. And I don't ride motorcycles anymore because okay. I don't pay enough attention. Right. Sometimes I don't even pay enough attention on television <laughs> programs. <laughs> <laughs> but not when you're here. Right. Uh, how absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And what a marvelous place to be in, at the very cutting edge of the future. I think that's the great excitement of science. That is. And that's what we have to teach young people, that it's exciting. Not that it's, you know, I think we overdo it with math. We say math, 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 and we frighten them off. Right. right. But if you talk about the excitement, the incredible things, a future that we, you know, our future has changed so much in the last 30 years it's going to change more. Thank you for being with us. Th thank you for having and me. And good luck in your future. You. We'll be thank back you. on the same stations at the same time next week. Cheers. White House Chronicle is produced in collaboration with WHUT, Howard University Television. From Washington, D.C., this has been White House Chronicle, a weekly analysis of the news with insight and a sense of humor, featuring Llewellyn King, Linda Gasparello, and guests.